Van Lewis, and the title of her project is The Rhetoric of War, The Changing and Unchanging Motivation of the Georgia Abkhazia Conflict. Well, I think it's appropriate that we're moving from one post-Soviet <laughs> conflict to the exactly, next. Exactly, <laughs> we're doing all the frozen conflict. Um, so in the, over the last year, outside of class, I've been doing a lot of research on the so-called frozen conflicts, and something that, the question that kept occurring to me is what makes these conflicts so intractable? Why do we have these conflicts still existing 20 years after they first started? So thinking about that more, the more primary question I suppose is then what's motivating these conflicts? What um, do first causes matter now, uh, 20 years later after the start of these conflicts? Um, or have the motivations changed? Like are the things that need to be addressed in conflict resolution now different than they were? Or have we still been, are we still fighting over the same issues? Um, my conclusion, at least from looking at the case of Abkhazia, is that the first causes do matter. We're still fighting over the same issues that we were fighting over in 1992. Um, so first, a brief um, reason for why I chose Abkhazia as opposed to South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, or Transnistria, all of which are also very interesting. And if I was writing a dissertation, maybe I would compare them also to Abkhazia, but that's a project for another day. Um, Abkhazia is the most interesting to me because there are two incidents of conflicts isolated by, um, from each other by a long period of time, almost 14 years separate. Um, the final ceasefire um, in the first conflict, which was 1992 to 1994, and then the renewal of violence in August 2008. Um, additionally, the political environment um, in surrounding this conflict changed significantly. The political leaders changed in Georgia, Abkhazia, and Russia, and brought with them um, very significant political changes. So um, when conflict first began, or I should say when um, Abkhazia was first moving towards separatism, um, Georgia was led by Zviad Gamsakhurdia, um, who was very nationalist and often very violent in his rhetoric against ethnic minorities in Georgia. Um, he was replaced by Shepard Nazi after a coup in um, early 1992. Mm -hmm. Shepard Nazi was leader of Georgia throughout the first instance of conflict. And then of course you have Mikhail Saakashvili taking over as president of Georgia in 2004, and he was president during renewed conflict in 2008. In Abkhazia, um, when Abkhazia first began to um, express its separatist aims in early in 19, 1989, um, it was led by actually the uh, People's Forum, uh, which met in Likni, and it was called the Likni Congress. But then in uh, 1990, Vladislav Artsinba was elected the Speaker of the Abkhazian Parliament, and he is a very vocal leader um, for Abkhazia. Then during 2008, um, the, the leader of Abkhazia was Sergei Bagapsh, and then, as we all know, we went from having uh, Boris Yeltsin as president of uh, Russia during the first instance of conflict to having, um, well, Putin was president during the run-up to a lot of the conflict, and then Medvedev took over um, shortly before conflict began again in August 2008. So a lot of changes occurred um, in the environment surrounding the conflict, which also makes a very interesting case study, I think. And then additionally, um, Abkhazian leaders are very vocal. And there's actually a lot published um, from the Abkhazian documents. Um, so you really can look very in-depth into what was going on in the Abkhazian government um, during this time, um, actually all the years. They've published quite well, actually. And so we have a lot of um, uh, Vladislav Arzimba's letters, his declarations, his statements, and then also Sergei Bagapsh also um, was very vocal towards the Russian media. So we have a lot of interviews with them also. So that's why I decided to focus on Abkhazia as opposed to any of the others. Uh, so as I stated, um, my thesis is that the stated motivations of the conflict did not change um, from 1994 to 2008. Um, the causes of the conflict, um, the, the details um, are sometimes changed, the conflict shifts slightly um, due to Russia's changing role in the conflict, but the underlying themes remain the same. So I've mentioned the two periods that I'm focusing on, um, and I do focus in my paper um, around the two periods of um, violence. So 1990, August 1992 um, to uh, May 1994, and then August 2008. Um, I also look at in the months leading up to 2008 because that's when there's a lot of this uh, rhetoric being advanced. Um, and then also, um, 
in order to understand why conflict happened in 1992, it's necessary to look at Abkhazian separatism, at least briefly, um, which, as I mentioned, began in 1989. And so there was a lot of um, political movement um, from 1989, 1989 up to 1992 when violence actually began. Um, I focus mostly on statements by leaders because uh, they're indicative of the uh, political movement of the country. And then also, I mean, sometimes rhetoric doesn't always match up with reality, especially in Russia's case in 2008, as I'll mention later. Um, but in this conflict, um, in my opinion, a lot of what happens on the ground is motivated by what's said in the press, what's said by the governments. Um, there are, the leaders are responding to each other. Um, there's a, a big back and forth. This is particularly evident between um, Saakashvili and Putin and Saakashvili and Medvedev. So I really look at what's being said, um, what the parties to the conflict claim are their reasons for um, disagreement. So I find that um, for um, Abkhazia, the main drivers of the conflict, or first of all, the main driver for separatis separatism is the right to self-determination. This is what was expressed by the Lakhmi Congress in 1989 as the Soviet Union was loosening up. Um, Abkhazia in the Soviet Union had the status of an autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, so an ASSR. Um, they had a significant amount of um, autonomy from Georgia, even though they were technically in a constitutional uh, relationship with Georgia. <laughs> complicated, um, but whenever Abkhazians felt that Georgia was encroaching on their sovereignty or their autonomy, they were able to appeal to the center, and often cases were able to push back against any um, encroachment that they felt was coming from Georgia. But Abkhazia had the status of a full Soviet Socialist Republic briefly um, in the uh, early period of the Soviet Union after 1921. Um, until Stalin uh, rescinded that and um, made it an ASSR um, in relationship with Georgia. Um, so the Lakhmi Congress references this, um, says this is our basis for claiming the right to self-determination, also the universal right of peoples to self-determination. Um, another um, driver that's uh, for Abkhazia that goes along with that is uh, preservation of their autonomy and sovereignty. As rhetoric was picking up in Georgia about seceding from the Soviet Union as Georgia moved closer to independence and finally did declare independence from the Soviet Union. Abkhazia worried, the Abkhazian leaders worried what would happen to their autonomy. If they were able to protect their autonomy by appealing to the center under the Soviet Union, what would happen when they couldn't appeal to that center, when Georgia took them out of the Soviet Union with them? Um, and then once conflict actually did begin in 1992, um, this idea of genocide comes up, and the language of genocide is used um, repeatedly by Vladislav Artsenbach, um, that Georgian forces in Abkhazia are committing genocide against the Abkhazian people and other ethnic minorities within Abkhazia, not just Abkhazians. Um, and this is something that also came, was a response to the fact that for a very long time we had a violently anti-minority leader of Georgia in Gomsoherdia. These motivations stay very much the same in 2008. Um, the accusal of genocide comes up again from Sergei Blakov. She says that when Georgian forces invaded South Ossetia, they were seeking to commit genocide against the Ossetians, and that Abkhazia was next in line. Um, again, you have the um, preservation of autonomy. At this point, Abkhazia has de facto statehood and have all the institutions of government, um, again, supported by Russia, but. Um, so the idea that they need to protect this, and then you have um, this also response to Saakashvili saying that we're going to, um, to retake control of Abkhazia, and he made this a central tenet of his presidency from the moment he was inaugurated. And then lastly, um, in February 2008, Kosovo received recognition from many other countries. This, right, um, this idea of the right to self-determination of peoples becomes, again, a very large issue, and the Abkhazians say of Kosovo can be recognized, why can't we? Um, so, motivations all the same, the Abkhazians are bringing up the same issues, just the context sometimes slightly changes, like with the Kosovo, what they call the Kosovo precedent, for example. <coughs> so, Georgia, for them, sovereignty is also an issue. In um, the first instance of conflict, um, the issue is obtaining sovereignty. 
Sandy Cornell makes the argument that you can't claim to be sovereign if you don't have control over your entire, what you're claiming as your entire sovereign territory. And so for um, leaders like Amso Kharia, who's attempting to um, secede from the Soviet Union, having um, a region that, over which Georgia doesn't have control is problematic for their claims of sovereignty, especially when they're trying to receive recognition from the international community. He also advances this idea of the historical unity of Georgia. Abkhazia is an integral part of Georgia and always has been, and he um, often ignores any um, cultural or historical separateness of the Abkhazian people. Um, Shepard Nazi um, talks also about the discrimination against ethnic Georgians, so he kind of reverses the um, uh, victimhood narrative, um, saying that Abkhazians are also discriminating against ethnic Georgians in Abkhazia. And then something that Kamso Hurdia brings up that's very central is this idea of the Russian victimization of Georgia, um, that Russia is just um, wanting, never doesn't want to see a successful independent Georgia. Shevard Nazi also advances this, but more subtly. He says that there are imperialist elements within Russia um, that are seeking to um, undermine Georgia. Um, he doesn't say it's the actual Georgian government itself, because at this point, Russia was not actually um, officially involved in the conflict, although the Russians were fighting on the ground. Um, and Saakashvili unites these narratives of the historical unity of Georgia and um, the Russian and the um, obtainment preservation of sovereignty. Um, so he also, of course, as we know, mentions a lot about the um, victim Russian victimization of Georgia. That he mentions again and again that Russia doesn't want a strong, successful Georgia. He mentions particularly NATO um, in this speech. Um, that the reason that Russia is so opposed to Georgia joining NATO is they don't want a successful Georgia on their border. Um, I treat Russia slightly differently than I do um, Abkhazia and Georgia because they weren't actually officially party to the conflict um, in the first instance of violence, although Russians were involved in violence. As I said, there were volunteers from the North Caucasus fighting in Abkhazia, and there were rogue elements of the uh, former Red Army also involved, but not under direct orders from the center, and Yeltsin did not want them involved. and. Um, made sure that he said that repeatedly. Um, but in 2008, the Russian role changed significantly. Russia was, um, Russian involvement in the conflict was official and sanctioned by the center. So by the end of the paper, when I'm looking at 2008, I do treat Russia as a party to the conflict with its own motivations. However, its rhetoric does not sync up with that. Um, the rhetoric advanced by the Russian leadership at this time was one of um, humanitarian, uh, being a mediator and a guarantor of peace. So they're saying that they're there to um, keep uh, in their historical role as um, the guarantor of peace in the Caucasus, which they say they've always filled. And indeed, there were Russian peacekeepers there from 1994 on after the ceasefire. Um, and then also they um, say that they are um, protecting Russian citizens abroad after many um, citizens of Abkhazia received passports from Russia <laughs> in the years leading up to 2008. Um, so my conclusions are that this is actually one of the um, greatest obstacles to resolving the conflict is this um, disagreement and rhetoric about, or this mismatch in rhetoric and actuality of Russia's role in the conflict. Uh, Russia is actively and officially involved in violence, yet they say they claim publicly um, that they are a mediator and a guarantor. And they continue to fulfill this role in um, nego ongoing negotiations. But this leaves many Georgian issues unaddressed because they also see Russia as a party to the conflict. So while um, the ongoing negotiations can make some progress, as long as Georgians and Abkhazians are speaking with each other, no final resolution to this conflict can ever be reached as long as there is this disagreement about Russia's role to the conflict. And then lastly, um, first causes do matter. Um, a lot of uh, Georgian narratives are the same and um, often expanded um, from in 2008 from 1994. And as I already mentioned, um, Abkhazian grievances were also the same. Um, and then Russian concerns remain the same even as their position changed. So 
um, one major um, uh, narrative in Russian rhetoric in 2008 was um, opposition to Georgia joining NATO, and this concern about security on its southern border, which was also something Yeltsin was very concerned about. But the way they approached that was different. Um, in 2008, Putin and Medvedev addressed that by joining conflict, whereas in 1994, Yeltsin just wants everybody to calm down so that there can be more security in um, on his southern border, and so that's he's trying to prevent conflict there. But again, the narratives are the same; they change very little. Um, and I think that's important to note for anybody who's attempting to work on conflict resolution now. You have to understand where this conflict came from in order to get it where we want it to go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I note that yesterday Medvedev gave his final interview uh, as president, and when asked about Georgia, he said, we love the Georgian people, but, you know, Saakashvili, we... That's you know, yet another, same, yes, you know, yet we're, another we're not motivation. gonna deal with him, and he's, he said that all the time, but yeah, <laughs> because they've always made this distinction. And, and then again, you come really to the same issue of what's a Russian peacekeeper. Right. Yes, we, <laughs> these, we've discussed this often. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean to be a peacekeeper if you're part of the conflict? Yeah. Questions, comments? I can talk more. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, good. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you talked about this a little bit last week, that someone had asked um, what was kind of the demographic situation in the region, because I know um, the Georgian side kind of comes with, well, you Alphas are not even the majority in Alphas, why do you think that you should pick be independent and uh, things like that? I wondered if, if you had looked at it kind of the history of how demographics had changed within Alphas yet, like during the Soviet period. So I've also heard the Alphas side say that, well, Georgia was like flooding Abkhazia with newly settled Georgians to actively change. I wonder if, if you looked into that, how, yeah. how that affected, or if that kind of led to how all this erupted. I mention it briefly, but it's hard to address because demographics are very uncertain, especially in Abkhazia, and it's a very politically charged issue. So there's a lot of disagreement about exactly how many Abkhazians are there, how many Georgians are there. Um, the last reliable data is the last Soviet census in 1989 in which the Abkhazians were a decided minority in Abkhazia and in fact um, Georgians or Mingrelians were the majority and one of the one issue was that um, the way that the political representation worked was in, in under an agreement reached between Gamso Kurdia and the Abkhazian parliament um, there were 28 um, representatives in the Abkhazian parliament set aside for ethnic Abkhazians and 26 for Georgians and the rest for other minorities. So they were overrepresented, um, at least if you're um, thinking about matching up representatives to percentage of population. Um, but after that, it gets really tricky to talk about because it's uncertain because you have a lot of internally displaced persons that aren't well documented, some that are, that go, that are displaced and come back. Um, I mean, a big issue for the Abkhazians was that um, the Georgian population was increasing in Abkhazia um, from the um, early period, point of the Soviet Union, 1930s to 1989, I think the percentage of um, Georgians increased from 20-something to 46%. Um, but then once, after once the final ceasefire was reached, um, when the Abkhazians retook Sukhumi, they retook almost all of Abkhazia except for the Upper Kadori Gorge and pushed out um, almost 200,000 internally displaced persons, most of them Georgian. Some of them have been able to go back, and the, also the way the administrative boundary line is set up right now is tricky, so people come and go, um, not freely, but they are able to move back and forth. So. I don't have a lot of conclusions to draw about that just because the state of it now is so uncertain. Yeah. Um, on the Russian role and how it has been changing, although rhetoric has had some continuity, I understand there's been something of a shift inside of Abkhazia, and I'm really not sure about this, but I've heard that Abkhazians are becoming a, a little bit discontented, having, having jumped to get mm -hmm. the Russian passports, having sort of bought into the Russian protectorate idea, there's now some discontent. Oh, could you say anything about 
Yeah, I don't address it in my paper because it kind of comes after the period I'm looking at. Sure, but I understand. Something... I'm sympathetic. That's why I didn't ask the question at first. <laughs> but I've been reading a lot about it in the work I've been doing, not on my capstone. Um, and it's definitely something I'd like to look into further if I ever take this topic up again. Um, Abhazi receives millions of rubles from Russia. Um, many of the um, ministers in the government, our deputy ministers, are Russian. Um, the administrative boundary line is administered by Russian troops and FSB agents. Mm -hmm. So um, the entire, almost the entire security apparatus in Abkhazia is run by Russia, funded by Russia, and is composed of Russians. Um, so there is a lot of dependence in Abkhazia on Russia, but that being said, their current president was not Russia's first choice. Um, so there's some political pushback, they don't always necessarily toe the line that um, Russia wants them to. Um, I'm not sure where that's going to go because of the financial dependence and the um, institutional dependence on Russian support. But they are um, at least more independent than, for example, South Ossetia had been. Um, it, so it's, it's, an, it's an interesting dynamic, the relationship between the two. Um, when you talk about rhetoric and you quote leaders, my question would be, how much do does the population espouse this rhetoric? Because, for example, um, say um, uh, Saakashvili has an opposition and people who disagree with him. However, the ideas he puts forth on uh, so on Abkhazia mm -hmm. are they so much um, so popular with um, um, the Georgian people throughout, like regardless of uh, political affiliation that what he says really does encapsulate the um, people. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that if what Saakashvili says encapsulates the will of the entire Georgian people, and in <laughs> fact the, Ru the Russian leadership makes the point of saying that it doesn't. Um, I have seen some opinion polls from after immediately after the conflict wherein um, people were actually very unhappy with the, conf uh, the renewed conflict because they said that they thought that it would um, only drive a positive reintegration with Georgia. I mean, the, I didn't look, I didn't focus on um, popular opinion, both because it's hard to measure, especially from the earlier period, but also because, um, again, a lot of what actually happens on the ground is driven by what the people who are in charge of troops um, think and what their opinions on it are. So that's the reason why I focused on what they were saying mostly. I guess the opposition in Georgia today is mainly against Saakashvili's domestic politics and what they see as his mm -hmm. increasing authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. It's not really so much on foreign policy, although they would prefer a better relationship with yeah. Russia. There's a lot of pushback yeah. if they try to address that issue. Yeah. Traitors, I yeah. think he was called. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's, it's delicate. <laughs> Yes. Um, Eugene, have you been able to gauge any involvement or increased maybe involvement of the Abkhaz diaspora that's significant in Turkey? I hadn't mm -hmm. looked at that actually, I'm going to be quite honest. I mean, the only um, things I came across in the diaspora were regarding the earlier conflict. Um, there were a couple of scholars actually here and in Europe that had written about the earlier instances of conflict, but I haven't seen anything recently. So they've been pretty quiet? Um, at least that I saw, but again, it's not an avenue that I pursued very carefully, so I may have, that may be something to look into further. Further research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>